Greetings and welcome fellow students, uh, fellow men and women of God, fellow bond servants in Christ Jesus, fellow saints in Christ. I greet you in the name of Jesus and I am happy to be with you. Amor Ahinya and I just want to open by saying Nyesai Ber. Amen. Nyesai Duong. Amen. And uh, of course, I want to ask you, Idinave. Adi Maber Kuom Ruth. Adi Maber Kuom Ruth. Ruth. And um, as we get ready to study God's Word today, I also want to greet you with this Kuom Unjogo Moye Weach Nyesai Oti Ngimau. Amen. And so let's trust the Lord to develop great fruit in us so that we may bring glory and honor to Him. So this is um, uh, part six now of the joy and relevance of the Old Testament and Old Testament survey part one. I'm sorry, this is lesson six, part one. So part one of Old Testament survey is, is uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Today we're getting into Exodus. So this is lesson uh, number six. And of course, before we get into God's Word and before we get into the lesson itself, it's always vital that we pray. So while them, let us, let us pray now. Heavenly Father, I thank you for every man and woman that is... Uh, a student at Elam Theological Institute. I bless them now in the name of Jesus. And Father, we join together and we ask your kingdom come now and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven in each of our lives and in the lives of the people that you have entrusted to us and in the lives of the unsaved throughout Siah and beyond, and in the lives of those who have grown cynical towards the church and are no longer attending church. Father, we pray that you would give us your heart for them, and we pray that we would be hungry and thirsty to learn your word and to hear it with faith and to hear it with a desire to obey. We pray that you would be glorified in this time, in this teaching. And without your presence, Holy Spirit, without your leading, without your guidance, without your teaching, without your instruction, we can do nothing. And so we say, Be Roho Maler, Njo Roho Mtakatifu. Come, Holy Spirit, and glorify the Father and the Son, and build the church that you love. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I want to begin, my, my friends, if I can not drop everything. I want to begin in, uh, actually in the New Testament, in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. Actually, I'll begin in verse 1, where Timothy, Paul says to Timothy, You therefore, my son. Isn't that just an affectionate way that Paul addresses Timothy, his son in the faith? You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And let's pray uh, that, Father, help us to be strong in in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So my friends, this is just a reminder that, that we are privileged to be able to study the Word of God in an in-depth manner. But it can't begin and end with us. We have to have a heart to disciple others. 
to mentor them, to raise them up, uh, to go beyond ourselves, to reproduce ourselves. That is where the church of Jesus in Kenya and throughout Africa and throughout the world has its greatest power when we mentor, when we disciple others. And that is what this is all about. That is That should be our goal. It should be our marching orders. Amen? Praise the Lord. Now, we are today in what is called the Book of Redemption, the Book of Exodus. The whole history of how God uh, brought an enslaved people out of the most powerful, out of the domination of the most powerful nation in the world at the time, Egypt, and set them free and brought them towards the promised land uh, to fulfill his promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which we read about uh, and learned about in the book of Genesis. Now, in your notes, um, I'm asking you to do a little bit of a devotional study. We're not going to take care of that time right this moment. We'll get, we'll hit these verses a little bit later. But Exodus is actually a Greek title uh, that is used for this book. And obviously it means departure uh, from slavery in Egypt. The Hebrew title is literally, now these are the names. And that's after the very opening verses of the book. One Old Testament scholar uh, that I really appreciate. His name is Gleason Archer. I believe he's correct in stating that the theme of the book of Exodus is the beginning of Israel as a covenant nation. And I like to put it this way. I think it would be better stated that it is Yahweh's covenant people or nation. So Exodus describes and explains the overall view of Exodus is the beginning of the people of Israel as God's covenant nation, as God's covenant people. Um, similarly, uh, another scholar writes, the Exodus dominates the Old Testament perspective and it becomes the first focus of divine redemption, which would be eclipsed only by the greater deliverance which God accomplished by the death of his son on Calvary. We're going to find that Exodus over and over and over points to the great deliverer, Jesus. To the great deliverer who is greater than Moses, Jesus. So Exodus is important because it prepares the way for us for the greater revelation of of the coming of the Messiah, not just for the nation of Israel, but for the Gentiles as well. That's you and me. Exodus is a history of how God was faithful, as I mentioned a moment ago, to keep his promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Exodus is a history of how God deals with nations especially as they relate to the people of Israel. And it's a history of world redemption. When we, we're not going to get so much into how God deals with the nations because this is an Old Testament survey, uh, but I just want to hit that at least because it is important. Exodus, of course, is a theology. There's rich theology. It's a theology of first and foremost, it is a theology of Yahweh, the personal, active, covenant-keeping one. It is a theology about his nature, and we're going to find profound, very deep things about the nature of Yahweh, which, which in my mind in some ways surpasses the way he is described, even surpasses how he's described in the New Testament. I'll show you why when we get there uh, shortly. So it's a theology of God. It is a theology of man. It, it exposes man's sin yet again. It's a theology. There's a lot of theology about sin, but 
there is a theology of redemption. Certainly, we see judgment in the book of Exodus as well. Uh, similarly, as I just alluded to, it is a book rich in Christology. What is the word Christology? I probably should write that down, which means I need to, uh, to uh, erase this. So Christology is primarily a study of the New Testament about Jesus. But there's Christology in the Old Testament as well. Remember why? Because the Old Testament is preparatory for the New Testament. So, uh, Koro, Christology. Christology is the study of Jesus or the Messiah, the Christ. Messiah is Hebrew for the Savior, and Christ is not Jesus' last name, but it's, it's uh, from Christos in Greek, Christos, which means anointed, anointed. And that is what Messiah means in Hebrew. Mashiach is anointed one. I think I'm going to uh, define that word anointed um, in this study, if I'm not mistaken. And then Christos is Greek for anointed as well. So Christology is the study of Christ. Ology in uh, Greek it comes from logos, which is a uh, word. And it really, theology is a study of the Word of God. That's really what it's all about. Now, Koro, <laughs> you all, those of you, well, you know, I just love that word. So I just have to use the word Koro uh, or To. So uh, Exodus um, is, is a book rich in Christology. And we see that especially in the Passover. I can't wait uh, to, to teach on the Passover. Uh, in the tabernacle as well, all the pieces, the way the tabernacle is laid out, all points to Jesus and the priesthood as well, preparatory for the great high priest. Now, Exodus continues to reveal how sin brings bondage, both spiritual and then physical. We find that the people of God who simply went down to Egypt from Israel, from the land of promise, to escape famine, they became a minority in Egypt, and then the majority uh, took advantage of them and enslaved them. That's just human nature. But we also find an entire country enslaved spiritually. So the Egyptians themselves are in bondage to um, idolatry to their pagan gods and goddesses. They, they worshiped false gods and goddesses. And even their own ruler, the Pharaoh, which is simply a title uh, uh, for him as, as the king, if you will, the ruler of Egypt, um, he, uh, he thought of himself and was thought of as a god. Well, it, that still happens today. The ruler of North Korea uh, demands people to worship him, and he sets himself up as God in that nation. And not surprising, surprisingly, the, the nation of North Korea is one of the poorest nations on the planet with very, very little freedom at all. Because when man uh, ascends, he often becomes a tyrant if he does not understand that he is accountable to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And there's a good reminder for us who are entrusted with spiritual leadership that we are not to rule and reign as tyrants, but as servants. Remember, because Jesus came, said, said, I came not to be served, but to serve and give my life a ransom 
for many. So we are servant leaders. We are to get under the people and push them up to God. We're to be patient with them. We're to love them. We're to pray for them. We're to bless them and honor them and serve them, not rule over them, not dominate them. And friends, they are not our people. They don't belong to you. They belong to Jesus. We are just caretakers temporarily to bless them and honor them. Can I hear an amen there? So uh, Egypt became arrogant against the living God as opposed to the dead gods and idols who were powerless. They became, the Egyptians became arrogant against the living God who in his redemptive nature selected one man again, just like he selected uh, Noah and then he selected Abraham and then he selected Isaac and then he selected Jacob and then he selected Joseph and he brought redemption through these individuals. So he, in his redemptive nature, God selected one man, Moses, to reveal himself his love, his faithfulness, and his power by delivering an enslaved people from the mightiest empire in the world. And he did it with an outstretched arm with the 10 plagues to defeat the gods and goddesses that the Egyptians trusted in. Moses, of course, is the chief figure uh, throughout the book of Exodus. Another uh, Old Testament scholar, Samuel Schultz, writes this. He says, repeatedly, the prophets and the psalmists acclaim Israel's deliverance from Egypt as the most significant miracle in their history. So you're going to see throughout the major prophets and the minor prophets. Remember now, the major prophets are not import, more important than the minor prophets. They're only named major because of the volume. So the, what are the major prophets? They are Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. The minor prophets are the shorter books. They're all the Word of God. They're all important. But you see them repeatedly refer uh, to the miracle of the Exodus. And of course, you see uh, the miracle of, of Exodus um, taught in, in throughout the book of Psalms as well. Exodus, my friends, is, is also the story of God's progressive worldwide redemption. Progressive meaning, uh, you know, one day at a time, one year at a time, not all at once, but progressive. Um, as he begins to lead his people into the promised land, where they were to become an evangelistic people to the Gentiles and where the Savior of the world would be born. Now, of course, the people of Israel failed substantially in becoming an evangelistic people uh, to the Gentiles, but where they failed, um, redeemed Israel, the Messianic Jews, the apostles, they were used by God as Jewish believers in the Messiah to get the gospel out to the whole world. So one another commentator argues that Exodus forms the high point of Old Testament redemptive history. You can see why the book of Exodus is so important just in, in these comments, but we're going to see even more so why as we move through. So he says Exodus forms the high point of Old Testament redemptive history as the means through which God made Israel his vehicle for the redemption of all humanity. He does it through Moses and then from Moses to the entire people. Once again, God chooses to use one man through whom he will bring worldwide redemption. Moses, the greatest leader and prophet of Israel until Jesus. Although Jesus himself said John the Baptist was the greatest prophet of all. Uh, but so we would say Mo Moses was until John the Baptist. It's Moses 
who is the great deliverer. He was delivered by God. Uh, Moses is, is Hebrew for uh, pulled out of the water. And so that's a prophetic act for what will come. Moses is the great deliverer. He's deeply concerned for the people. Moses is the miracle worker through whom God brings his deliverance for Israel. The greater Moses to come will perform even greater miracles because only he can change hearts. Moses couldn't change the hearts of the people and grew frustrated accordingly, but Jesus himself as God is able to change our lives and be our savior. Moses wasn't the savior of the people. Yahweh was the savior of the people. Um, so Moses, it's to Moses that Yahweh reveals himself as the covenant keeping, a personal, active God in one of the most important verses in the entire Bible. In Exodus chapter 3, verses 13 through 16. As a matter of fact, um, since we haven't gotten enough into the Word of God yet, let's turn there now to Moses, uh, to Moses, to Exodus uh, chapter 3, and we're going to read verses 13 through 16. This is the encounter where, where Yahweh uh, comes to reveal himself to Moses, and he issues the call uh, to Moses to be his man, to be his representative, to be his apostle, if you will. God calls Moses uh, to deliver his people, Israel. So in verse 13, we read, Then Moses said to God, Behold, I am going to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? Now think about this. The people of Israel had been enslaved in Egypt for 430 years. Some of them had maintained worship uh, to the God of Scripture, but many of them had not. They perhaps were influenced by the Egyptian gods and goddesses. Maybe they had given up in worshiping God. And so there's a whole new generation that doesn't know him. And consequently, you see throughout Exodus a lot of teaching about the nature of Yahweh. So Moses is already recognizing that they are very ignorant of God. And there are many gods, so they want to know, okay, so you're coming in the name of God. Well, which God is it? So it's interesting that God's response to Moses is this. I am who I am. I am, or I will be who I will be. The Hebrew word is ehya, ehya. And it is a, um, it's in your notes, but it is a verb, which means I am, or I will be. The, um, the verbal form, excuse me one second, Sorry about that. So, ehya is a verb which means to be. What does that say? Uh, to be. What that says about Yahweh is he is what? He is active. He is an active God. He is not uh, many gods and goddesses of the Old Testament period and in Egypt were territorial. So they were gods that dwelt in certain places, uh, you know, like the god of thunder or the god of agriculture that the people pray to. But what the people are going to find out about Yahweh is that he's active. So Ehya is the verb. Yahweh is the noun. That is his 
name. He is the living one. He is, um, he, he, he will be who he will be. He will do what he will do. And of course, in saying that to Moses, he wasn't revealing all of himself. He was giving Moses just a little bit of who he was. And he was requiring Moses to trust him. So he doesn't give Moses a lot of information, does he? I am. I will be who I will be. But did he back that up? Did he prove himself to be faithful? Oh, yes, he did. That's for sure. So the let's return back to uh, Exodus. In verse 14, God said to Moses, Echia. That's it. That's all it says in Hebrew. Echia. I am who I am, or I will be who I will be. Thus you shall say to the sons of Moses, I am Echia, has sent me to you. God furthermore said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial name to all generations. So the, the, um, the point of this is in revealing himself as Yahweh. He is, he is preparing the way for Jesus to come uh, hundreds of years later and, and for him to say over and over, I am the good shepherd. I am the light of the world. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And thus we see Jesus' claim to deity there um, in the Gospel of John. We'll get into that uh, shortly. Um, so again, the verbal form of the noun is echia, uh, to be, and the noun is translated I am. And the eternal significance of the meaning of this name uh, should immediately remind us of Jesus' approximately 26 I am statements in the Gospel of John. And again, clearly with such statements, Jesus is making a claim to equality with the Father. I actually have been doing, uh, for a couple days, I've been doing a study in John chapter 6. It's a fascinating study. And what do you see there in John 6? In John 6 verse 4, John tells us, that, that it was the Passover coming. And what we find Jesus saying in that teaching, he, he, fed, uh, he fed you know thousands of people uh, at the Sea of Galilee, at the Sea of Tiberias. Well, John tells us 5,000 men. So if there were 5,000 men, there were at least 5,000 women and there were at least 5,000 children, probably 10 or 15,000 children. So can you imagine having 20, 25,000 people with no food? And Jesus performs the miracle of from the five loaves and the two fishes. And, um, and then from there, he explains why he did it and the spiritual significance of it. And that's and he begins the teaching, the long teaching, in John 6.35 by saying, I am a go a me. Let me, let me translate it in Greek. Um, the Hebrew, uh, the Greek word, a go a me is I am. A go is I, and a me is I am. So it's a very, very strong way of Jesus saying, I am the bread of life. Uh, that your fathers ate the man in the wilderness and, uh, and died. Everyone who eats of this bread will live forevermore. 
So you see that before Abraham was, I am, I am the light of the world and so on and so forth. Now Yahweh, which in, uh, I don't know how it is for all of your Bibles um, in the NLT or in the um, ESV, um, but in my Bible, I have the New American Standard, every time uh, Lord is capitalized, so capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, that is Yahweh. But when Lord is in lowercase, so capital L, um, lowercase O-R-D, that is Adonai. Which is God's name that refers to him as Lord or Sovereign or Master. Those are uh, different names. Now Yahweh is used far, far and away in the Old Testament more than any other name for God. It's not even close. Yahweh appears in the Old Testament 6,000, 6,823 times. Uh, Elohim appears maybe 2,000, 3,000, something like that. So the amount of times that Yahweh appears in the Old Testament tells us how important that name is not because of the name itself, but because of what it signifies. Um, let's see, let's move on here. How are we doing time-wise? Um, we're at the 31 minute mark. All right, uh, so this, this reinforces how major such a revelation was intended to be to Moses, to Israel, and then to the Gentiles who would enter into a personal relationship with Yahweh. Now, let's just take it even further. And uh, you've already heard me uh, teach this, I hope. But as, as we find in the Old Testament and then throughout the New Testament, Yahweh also refers to the Father... the Son, and the Holy Spirit. One God, Echad, one, Echad, one in unity, one in unity. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh is our God. Yahweh is one, Echad, one in unity. I just love teaching on the, the, the triune God or the Holy Trinity. Um, now, let's see, I lost my place. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm there now. Moses would almost immediately come to see that what Yahweh promised he would perform. He never left Moses, and he did some of the greatest miracles ever known with, through, and for Moses and for Israel, and to demonstrate his lordship over all the earth with the Gentile nations. It's amazing how many of the pagan nations outside of Israel heard and knew about a God's deliverance of Israel through the Red Sea. It's amazing how even back in those days, news traveled pretty quickly. Now this Yahweh would prove that he was unlike any other Egyptian god or goddess. Indeed, he was and is the only god in existence backed up by his words of life, his presence, and his power. Equally important was and is his deep love. And my friends, this essential aspect of his nature and character was also revealed to Moses 
in Exodus chapter 34 and verses 6 and 7. This becomes one of the key passages in the entire Bible that reveals to us the deep, profound nature of who Yahweh is. Exodus chapter 34 and verses 6 and 7. Exodus chapter 34 and verses 6 and 7. If you can turn there with me, it would be good for you to see this. Exodus chapter 34. Let me back up to verse 5. Yahweh descended in the cloud and stood there with him, that is with Moses, as he called upon the name of Yahweh. Now watch what happens. Then Yahweh passed by in front of him and proclaimed, Yahweh, Yahweh Elohim, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness to thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. I'll explain that because I know some can be troubled by that. It's, But we have to keep in mind Hebrew language and how it's written rather than immediately trying to interpret it in our, in our own minds. So what we see here is, is Yahweh explaining to Moses who he is and what his nature is. And, of course, from there, Moses then would teach the people about the nature of Yahweh. And then from there, Yahweh, um, by the Holy Spirit, or we should say the Holy Spirit, is teaching us about his nature. So, the first thing that we find in, in verse 6 is he repeats his name, Yahweh, Yahweh. There are about ten occasions in the Old Testament where a name is repeated twice. My friends, this is a profound insight into Scripture. Um, if you'll hold on with me, hold on one second. Let me get my other Bible. That's where my notes are at about this. Um, in Exodus, you're already there, Exodus 34. Let me just mention to you all the occasions where uh, a name is repeated twice to indicate intimacy. And that's what, that's what Yahweh is indicating. This is a, let's put it this way. This is a tender moment uh, between God and Moses. God is not appearing to him in thunder and an and overwhelming power. He is appearing to Moses in a very gentle way. And he's speaking to Moses in a very gentle way. For example, when Jesus is hanging on the cross, what does he say? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Even David says that. This is a quotation of Psalm 22.1. How does Jesus um, speak to Martha? He's not rebuking her when he says, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things. But he's appealing to her tenderly. <laughs> when Saul, uh, who would become the Apostle Paul, is knocked off his horse, uh, when the lightning appears to him, what does Jesus say? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul's response was, who art thou, Lord? There's a, you know, it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. And, and I can, I'm, what I'm trying to convey to you is that Jesus, in, in, in appearing to Paul, I mean, that was powerful enough. 
and it probably terrified Paul, but when he spoke to Paul, it was in a very gentle, loving way. It's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. When, when um, Absalom died, David cried out, Absalom, Absalom, my son. David was broken. He was speaking in a compassionate way. Uh, Moses' name is repeated twice when God calls Moses. When Abraham is ready to plunge the knife into Isaac, the angel of the Lord says, Abraham, Abraham. There's a sense of affection there. Um, uh, Simon Peter, Simon, Simon, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you. There's an affection. There's a heart for uh, from God for uh, Simon Peter. Jacob's name is repeated twice. And then significantly, uh, when Jesus is, is weeping over Israel, what does he say? Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I have longed to gather you under my arms as a, as a hand gathers her chicks underneath her, but you are not willing. So there's this sense of, of affection and tenderness, which is absolutely profound and vital for us to truly come to know and understand just how God's nature is. Now, I, I want to show you that this isn't just my own interpretation. I want to show you in context. I want to prove it to you in context. Yahweh, Yahweh Elohim, what does he say? The very two words that he describes himself with, what does he say? Compassionate and gracious. Compassionate and gracious. In your notes, the word compassionate, let me write this down. Um, compassionate is racham. Racham. And it is, um, I'm not going to write all this down because I'm running out of time. Uh, it is a deep love. <laughs> Hallelujah. A deep love from a superior to an inferior. That's what, what God is conveying to Moses, to the people of Israel, and to us, is that he is, is a God with a deep love as a superior to an inferior. That's how he wants to relate to us. That's what he's saying to Moses. And then he says, and gracious. The Hebrew word gracious is a heartfelt response by someone with something to give to someone in need who also has no real claim to gracious treatment. You see, friends, now we can understand the tone of, by which Yahweh is speaking to Moses. He's revealing, what does he say in about himself in the New Testament? In 1 John 4, verse 8, God is love. And I believe that our Heavenly Father is imparting a sense to us now of the Father heart of God, helping us to realize how tender he is. Uh, Paul says in Philippians 1, uh, to the church in Philippi, I think it's Philippians 1, 7, how I long for you all with the affection, with all the affection of Christ Jesus. Paul talks about in Romans, uh, I think it's, it's either Romans 15 or 16. I think it's Romans 16. Uh, he refers to the love of the Holy Spirit. Are you getting this? Yahweh. Yahweh. I am personal. I am active. I am faithful. I keep covenant with you. And now I'm going to let you know that I am Raham. I have a deep love for you. I am gracious. I, when I help you, it's a heartfelt response. Well, we see that clearly when the Father sends the Son to die on a cross for us. And how does he explain it? Jesus tells us, For God so 
loved the world that he gave his only unique son. John 3, 16. Isn't that amazing? Friends, loved ones, are you getting a sense of the Father heart of God that is being revealed at the very beginning that this is why I call this course the joy of the Old Testament, the joy and the relevance of the Old Testament for believers today. There's not a verse like this even in the New Testament. It is so deep, so rich, so powerful, and there is a lot more to come.